Welcome to the Localization Fireside Chat. I'm Robin Ayoub, your host. Join me for captivating conversations with industry leaders exploring localization, translation, and global communication. Ignite your curiosity as we expand your horizons through these conversations. So let's dive in together into the Localization Fireside Chat. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining me today for a Localization Fireside Chat episode. We're close to Christmas. We're December 15th. And today's episode, today's interview, today's conversation, we are, I am so proud and I'm so like excited to have this conversation because I'm joined by a legend who has been on the Multilingual Magazine numerous times. And I didn't know that until I, before I did some pre-work before this episode and find out the, the uh, Jeff Allen is one of the, you know, lock and roll. Like you've got YouTube videos, you've got music. Like I've seen people like with various experience in this industry, you know, to have it to the next level doing music about the industry. I never thought this is possible. And there you go. So I'm really excited. Jeff, thank you for joining me. I really appreciate it. And uh, Jeff, on this channel, we say everybody's got a story. So if you don't mind, yeah. introduce the audience to your story and to tell a little bit about yourself. Thank you. Sure, sure. <clears throat> well, I started, I'm, I'm actually a real linguist. I'm a theoretical linguist. I, I did my master's, my, my bachelor's in French, in, in French and phonetics and literature. But then I went into do a master's in linguistics, in, in you know, theoretical linguistics. And my, master, my doctor work was in phonology and phonetics. So the Creole language is the Caribbean. So, and then because that did put a lot of food on the table, and I didn't go into being a teacher. I mean, I was a teacher in the university for a while. I went into, got, came in the back door through machine translation, automated translation, back 30 years ago with Caterpillar. And that opened up a lot of opportunities to work in like the, the high, the really the, the research and research on, and translation systems, speech systems early on, you know, doing statistical machine translation before it was known. And, and work with translation memory, other different things, and then and then work in databases of of, of linguist language based states, which is for the European Commission, and then working for a number of different solution providers of automated translation systems and speech systems, and and now uh, the buyer side for the past fifteen years. I've actually been here for fifteen years. I'm kind of amazed. Working action telecoms too. I've I've been in and out of the industry when these world crises come like 911 threw me out the whole um the, you know the whole crash in 2008 i had to go work in other things to put food on the table and that's what i did so i've worked in telecom as well telecom systems you know the hands the handshakes of our phones and stuff and helping the engineers for doing that and now working at doing predictive analytics and and other you know sap's got 2000 2000 applications so i'm working on them, about 20 of them in the past 15 years so that's kind of the overall story yeah, very interesting. I, you know, I'm interested in finding out like what drew you to languages, like initially, initially on, like uh, at the at the beginning. What 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 brought you? I hated to... math. I had a bad oh, yeah. math teacher. I had a ge <laughs> geometry teacher that just made me hate it. And then I got out of his class and went and did. Well, I actually did algebra in, in eighth grade, the U.S. system, to eighth year, and so I was about twelve years old. And and then I wanted to do languages. So I I did French and Spanish in seventh grade. Then they did math and eight, uh, algebra, and I said, I hate this. So in 10th grade, in the high school, I went back to languages and did French the, the second, third, fourth year. And in the final year at high school, I was actually a grading assistant for the French and Spanish teachers. I actually got an award for my high school for being a, a language assistant. This is like, no one does this, right? They do math or other things. I did language, right? So that set me on the course. And then I had my, my bachelor's and my, my first bachelor's and my second bachelor's are in language related topics. So it kind of, it went on from there. I'm doing that's math right. now. I'm, I'm doing math finally. That's what I was going to ask. There, I mean, but, you know, when you, when you do, you know, you go from one side of, you know, it's very funny, the human brain, right? So you either go, that's the general yeah. rule. You either go into literary or you yeah. go into sciences. But to see very rare that you see people that can jump between, you know, yeah. uh, social studies, literaries. Yeah. And to science-based degrees or intellectuals. Yeah. So, yeah. For you, how how's that? Like, I mean, you must well, have I mean, like I a did, wide I variety did, of. I, I actually have a, I have a, an associate and a bachelor's degrees in <laughs> in religious texts of the of the of the historic of of different religions, and so I did text analysis. 
but then when I did my bachelor's in French, I, I, I got to study phonetics and that just, I wanted to do that. And then I, I got sent to France for a year to teach uh, French as a foreign language. And then I discovered linguistics in, in the learning, you know, the theoretical linguistics. And this, from that moment on, I wanted to do phonetics. I just, there was something about the scientific aspects of it. That's it's, 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 you know, dealing with sounds. I, I spend my time dealing with sounds, hearing sounds, analyzing them and figuring out the dialect differences and dialects and stuff. So that's always kind of been my passion, but I, I, I look at tax too as corpora, you know, they're just corpora of helping find things. So it, right. it, it's been a, it's been a, and working in the language databases, the linguistic language databases for training language technologies with Elda and Elra. It just, it just kind of all, they kind of go together, you know, so. So Jeff, let's, uh, before we dive into the more serious topics, tell us a little bit more about yourself, where you're located, where you grew up, you know, and, and sure. you know, sure. what's the, you, you know, what's the, what's the personal side of Jeff Allen look like? Sure. Well, I was born in the United States and I spent my early childhood years in Minnesota. <laughs> There's lots of snow. <laughs> Walking to school, yes, one mile in the snow and wearing it, wearing, you know, basically a snowsuit for six months of the year. And then I moved back to Oregon. I was born in Oregon, but moved to Minnesota as a child and for basically the 10, the eight, nine, 10 first years in, in Minnesota. Soto, I should say it the real way, but then moved back to Oregon and uh, from basically eight years old until 23, I lived in Oregon in the Portland area. And I was the, the, that's the headquarters of Nike and Intel in, in Beaverton, Oregon. And so, and then, and then I did my two, I did two, worked at, went to two different universities. I, I, I actually cleaned toilets and cleaned things. I worked hard for 10, eight years to fund my two, you know, my two different university degrees in the U.S., and I got sent to France on a, on a fellowship to teach French. Came here, now I've been in France for basically 30 years. Back and forth a couple of years doing my master's at the university there. I was kind of sent, kind of just getting sent back. You know, I don't want to go into all the details. That's all by my LinkedIn profile. But, but, and then I finally got, came back to France and, hey, my second master's and all my, my doctor work was in France. It's cheap. You know, it's just, it's, it's, you know, funded by taxes basically. So I ended up working here and then, Went back for four years uh, with my my wife at the time, and and uh, and then I basically I've been back since 1999, back in France since 1998. Actually, I live here. You know, that's where I live, and out in the kind of the suburbs, the Fontainebleau area, this forest. So, so I'm out here. Next, I get my. This is the country <laughs> house, right? So with the fire, yeah. so with the get seventy. I know. I couldn't believe minutes, it. So. So we got to tell the audience. Like, I mean, we're localization fireside chat, and and you know, this is the first. The first individual that we interview, the first person that we interview, that we actually, you know, point the camera at an actual fireplace. You know, it's very, very nice of you, Jeff. I mean, you're you're just the, the epitome of the fireside chat. I really love that. That's great. Love it. Now, love now it. one of the things, one of the things that I really you mentioned a little earlier, you know, involvement into the uh, in the technology aspect of languages, and how yeah. you started with statistical machine translation. You must have some unique perspective on oh. that entire evolution from yeah. seeing it seeing it early on and seeing it now. And I'm interested in finding out like, you know, what do you think of the technology evolution A? And what do you think also of the human aspect of that technology integration, that hybrid model? Sure. I mean, this is what I spend my time. I, I work I, right now. I work in, in the artificial intelligence department of SAP and I spend the majority of my time writing blog posts and doing videos and doing conferences on this exact topic of, you know, what is it, what is a, what is AI and what it's not. And I spend my time telling people what it's not. <laughs> and so this is it. And I, as I, I've given a lot of, I've given a lot of talks, conference talks, and I put them in the video format on my YouTube channel at Jeff Allen France, where I talk a lot about the history of translation systems and speech systems. And it goes back to the, 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 the rule-based systems. I mean, that's what I was working on, you know, 30 years ago. And then some of the early statistical systems and the, what we call example-based, which is translation memory. I mean, I got a lot of papers and stuff in that, but I've got them on video format. And, and I've seen each one. I've worked in every one, right? Every single type of translation system. We got up to the neural systems today. And I've seen, I've worked with a lot of different solution providers, not just one brand, but several of them. So I've kind of seen how everyone does it and kind of walked through this whole thing of quality, what's quality. And now getting to now where generative AI is now changing, you know, it's, it's, it's really a game changer. It, it's, it's finally come. We've been waiting for 30 years, 50 years. We've been waiting for a breakthrough 
to say, is this going to really change? And we've seen in the past year, since November of a year ago, that people are grabbing onto this now. It's, it's on everywhere on LinkedIn. It's every day. It's everywhere. AI has hit it, right? And it's really about generative AI. So it's real simple. What it is, is we're moving from rule-based systems of tabular data, organized data in financial systems, which are, you know, easy to code and easy to kind of replicate things to going to a generative more, it's learning, it's learning from the data it's got. And then why we're doing it is because we need to automate and semi-automate. We can't pay for human people to do everything, every single repetitive task that hurts your hands and stuff makes you retire early, right? So we need to automate, semi make the human brain do more things than just hit hammers and stuff and all that, right? So we're finding ways to, or doing, you know, data entry, you know, all that. So we're trying to find ways to make that semi-automation, you know, process in place, but not replace people completely. It's make them use their brains more, right? So, and then how we're doing it is pretty simple. We need to make it, it's the whole three R's in AI. It's, we're making things relevant. So we're making sense relevant to each domain. It's reliable data because we have a lot of hallucinations, right? And mm -hmm. we're making it responsible. We need to do this in a responsible way so that we don't tell people we're going to replace you. It's we're going to boost your productivity and make you use your brain a little bit more, right? So mm -hmm. it's that's the what, the why and the how of this whole technology. And we're seeing language at the middle of this right now, right? L mm -hmm. Large language models. We're talking about this all over the place. Language is the key right now whether it be textual data, audio data, or visual data, to be able to kind of break through the usage of the technologies as a tool. That's, that's what it's, it's all cool. about. And that's why yeah, I spend absolutely. my time talking about and, it. And you know, we talk on this channel a lot about AI as an impacts language uh, industry in general. But, you know, one thing I, uh, I keep reminding people, and I should probably remind people more, is AI not just impacting language industry, it's impacting every single industry globally. It is yeah. so massive that if you're not in it, you're missing the boat, at least learn it, at least find out yeah. what can it do to your job, uh, to your business, to as a consumer, to how you consume things, services or goods. It's, imp it's impacting every single angle of our lives. And, and it, it will, it's going to increase. I was talking to somebody on this channel as well, we were talking about you know, like back in you and I, like you mentioned, back in the days kind of thing. So back in the days, and I'm a computer science, that's how I started my, 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 my career as a technologist. You know, we used to talk about development cycles that they're about a year. Every year you release a new piece of software or you update your software. Today, the development cycle is counted in days, even weeks in some cases, then that's too late in some cases. So the acceleration of development is driving brand new ideas to hit the market and quickly, fast, and if we don't keep up, we don't know what's coming around the corner yeah. and you're left in the dust kind of thing. So where we are right now in terms of going back to language, the language industry, in terms of the consumer of content of those tools, AI-based tools are trusting. And I talk a lot about, I hear a lot of talks about trust. Yeah. Are we at a phase right now where sort of like we're, we're open to ideas, but we don't know yet if we can trust or are we in, in, in a phase, and I'm talking in general here, in, an, in a phase where we trust and verify or we trust? No, no. I mean, the whole thing about the trust is people are scared, right? The, a lot of things are built on fear. And a lot of times I say, you know, we come back to the point too, we said that it's not, the, the statement is, it's not AI that will replace you. It's a human, a person using AI, the tool that will replace you. And people that adopt the technology early on and do it, and I've been doing that for 30 years, right? Yeah. I'm able to do more. And so that's the key is, is learning to use a tool as a tool, right? Not, it's not the technology, it's not the cyber thing doing this stuff. It's you using the tool to be able to do more in that. So that's a key thing. And the whole, that whole question about generative AI right now is, there are a lot of hallucinations and that are called confabulations, right? There's a new word for this. And it's based on the fact of how you train the data. And if you don't have enough data that's diverse, then it's going to be training on only certain data, right? And we can see the whole thing, male-dominated generative AI. It's, it's the, a lot of things that the data that's being trained on has been forced on looking at male-focused um, societal content that will generate male-dominant content, right? And so it's trying to have the diverse data that covers all different domains and all different you know, focal points of, of 
everything we can imagine that's diverse and inclu- diverse inclusion, right? And when we can do that, then it makes it easier, right? So, so we need to find ways to, tr- to have the data to train on. We can, we can generate that automatically too, right? Mm-hmm. We can generate that kind of data and make it available. So that's kind of the key thing is our, our, our challenge is how to do this because we can't, there aren't data warehouses for this stuff, right? And the hardest thing here of this reliable data is in the past, I, just, I did a conference talk in this last week about financial data. Financial data historically has been used as financial databases, right? Bank databases and things doing for predictive budgets and then looking backward on the budget of the year and then forecasting the future years. It's all in a single database, right? But now you've got, you get information press releases. You get info, that's all in this information that analysts think about. We imagine we can, we can actually go out and scrape their net, find all the press releases, analyzing each company, all that, and analyze that and use that to help provide a proposal of prediction, right? That's the key. And we aren't there yet because it's, not, it's a non-organized data. Tabular data is organized, right? It's all, it's all easy to code. It's unorganized, non annotated data that's our, that are, that are our challenge. We're scraping that, right? So this is the key, is how can we make that data reliable or validate it, right? And that's where the key, well, that's where we need people involved because the tabular data is simple, right? You always clean up, you make a fix, and then you make a fix in that little that, you know, box there or something that sell and it fixes it. But how you analyze, you know, LinkedIn profiles, how you analyze press releases and all this, that's subject to all kinds of interpretation. And that's why you need the people <clears throat> to be able to track and say that's not true, right? That's right. And, and you know what? You bring up a very good point there, Jeff, because, you know, you know, like the rest of us, I guess I have many, many conversations during the day and talk to various people about this particular topic. And, you know, the common theme that I'm hearing through, you know, the, if I analyze my conversation is, well, I tried chat GPT and, you know, it's uh, garbage. I didn't, like, I didn't like the output. I'm trying to translate to French and I didn't like it. Well, it's like going, saying, go and say, okay, I'm going to go to my local supermarket. I'm going to buy the food. I'm going to eat it while I'm on my way home. Uh, I didn't like the taste of it. Well, you didn't cook this stupid thing. <laughs> it's, I mean, I spend a lot of time talking to a lot of people that are not in the language industry, right? So <clears> I <throat> probably talk, I tell my bosses, I speak five, tens of, five to ten, 10 times a week on the topic. I can talk about retirement homes, right? I mean, talking anywhere. And the whole key, this is really touching the entire world, right? But the focal point that we're dealing with here is that it's, it's, we are getting to a point where we're not able to, how, let's say how to do this here. We're, we're, we're trying to move ahead and, 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 and dealing with the, this data. A lot of things we do, we're, we're analyzing, a human being is actually analyzing and filtering the information, right? And we need yeah. to teach a machine how to do that. And the only way you can do that is help the machine learn from what we've been doing as we do it regularly in filtering conversations. We decide if the information is real or not based on their conversation with the person, right? And, and the machine can't do that right now because it doesn't mm-hmm. know our social – we have a social history. Of, we have a, our brain – has learned from experiences, right? And the computer hasn't, isn't able to do that yet because it doesn't know yeah. all these one plus one equals two for a computer, right? But really for a human being, two plus two equals five because we get the social experience that the computer doesn't have. And that's our, that's our challenge right now is getting that point. And that's hard. That's hard to do that. And, and it's been, and, but it's now that we are in the area, in the era where we are in, I think the fundamental infrastructure is in place already to make, use of what we know as human being and teach it to the neural side of the, uh, of the, you know, the language models, statistical, uh, you know, did not have that capability, but that ability to learn, that ability to be taught as a technology. And so now it becomes, the onus becomes on us to be teaching those models or these algorithms, you you know, things that are a comply with us or mirror what we want to do satisfy a job. And there's a lot of discussion and I see that your involvement in ethical AI as well. So, so there is a lot of discussions, especially in, and I don't know, I haven't seen it much of it yet in the language industry. I've seen it, but not to the extent of, I see it in other industry, for instance, the financial sector right now, it's big on ethical use of, of, of AI because theoretically, and just theoretically, you can really 
have fun with AI when it comes to stock trading, when it comes to predicting the market, you know, up or down, et cetera. So any thoughts on ethical use of AI from your experience? That was the three R's of my how, right? The how. That's right. And how we're using AI is three R's. And three R's not, you know, it's something that comes out of that <clears throat> ethics. It's you want to make sure that your data is reliable or you're, you're is relevant. Everything you're doing is relevant to use cases and business scenarios and industry scenarios or whatever scenarios you want to call them. You know, SAP you call it business AI. It's just SAP, it's business AI for business, right? But we can do you can do AI for business. You can do industry. You can do it for academics. You can do it for research. You can do it for all you know, automotive. You can each, each domain. You can say it's relevant to that domain or sector or whatever. What do you want to call it, right? Then you want to see your data is reliable, and it's how much data you have and how good is it for that relevant area and domain right so that's the whole thing if you train it on generic stuff then you're going to get generic stuff right vanilla flavored ai and this is the problem of the work come back that question right now of, of how relevant it is it's because if you train on stuff that's fo too focused or too general it's not going to hit what your answers are right and that's where med i talk a lot of med doctors the doctors medical doctors they when they ask questions it's really it's very specific because they're able to pinpoint what they're looking for. If you ask the prompt very specific questions, you're going to get very specific answers. If you say, mm -hmm. you know, what's the, what's the length of a string? It's not going to know, right? So it's, it's how fine-tuned your questions are, your prompts, your, your prompts are doing it. So that's the, the kind of the, the, the data side that's reliable data. And the third one is responsible. How you're, how you're using this tool and what you're doing with it how you're using it is going to determine, you know, are you trying to replace people or are you trying to boost their productivity, right? And so mm -hmm. I'll say, you know, my, my key thing I tell us, you know, look back in the barcodes, right? We said 40 years ago, I remember because I, I had a roommate who was in, who was in, the, in, the, in college and he was, a, he was a, you know, he could do a 10 punch, 10 key punch, right? Coach, you could, he could only one product at a time, right? But he could do it really fast. But then we put in the barcodes about 30 years ago, right? And you had to have a scanner that was above the product. You had to, in the big packs of water. You couldn't send them through because it was too big, right? And then what it has, it pretty, you create a bunch of skate, you know, people on roller skates to go find the information in the aisle to find the right kit number, right? And so you had all these skaters that were actually costing more money because the, the insurance to, to have them, you know, you can collide with people in the aisles, right? So they were actually cost more, but they were getting the information, bring it back on roller skates. Now they're on walkie-talkies, right? Or phones, mobile phones, right? Then we got it. So you have a, you can have a, you can have a, a little pointer. You can actually decide it. You don't have to put the water, big cold out water. You can keep it in the cart and caddy, and you can point it and do it. So we're getting more products running through that that the cash register, right, with the barcodes, and we're getting to point now. We have cat, you know, automatic check, you know, check out yourself. But there are people sitting there manning these things, right? Or womaning, manning. I'm sorry. I don't, what's the word for <laughs> manning? <laughs> Womaning, womaning the, Let's the, use the, the word people. Peopling things. <laughs> peopling, yeah, peopling. And they are, I talk to these people. They're, they're, you know, they're, they're unblocking the system because you're buying some wine. It's under 18 years old, right? Or 21 yeah. or whatever. Age. And so we're, 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 what we're doing is we're, we've moved the cash register. They put the cash registers. We don't have to have the 10 key punch speed anymore. It's just they have to unblock, you know, one time there's a product you can run through, they have to do the key, but it's, you don't have to do it fast. But you got so much, pro so many products coming through, right? So many barcodes that the goal now is you got more people out in the aisles putting the stuff up. They're, they're taking the stock, moving it to the, the aisles, putting up on the shelves and stuff. That's where yep. the, the new workforce is. It's displacing the workforce. It hasn't, it hasn't removed the workforce. It's changed the skills and do it so you can put more products there, which is gaining more money for, you know, whatever. And you can hire more people, right? That's, That's right. So this and, is and, one example, right? And, and ladies and gentlemen, like what uh, Jeff is alluding to, or you know, in, as it applies to our language industry, is look, there is a huge amount of surge in content development. Everybody now is a content creator, and that content needs to be translated. Eventually, it needs to be translated. Some content may not be realized now that need to con to, to translate it, but every content is produced to a purpose, and that purpose is for consumer to consume the content. Eventually, the consumer of that content is going to say, well, it's not in my language. I can't consume it. Please make it into my language. And then when you have 50% increase in your content development, 
we don't have 50% increase in translators, the delta has to be filled by a technology that allows us to do more with the amount of people we currently have and we're going to have in the future. So again, I'm with you, Jeff. It is not, again, the people missing the boat on this one. It is not to replace the human, but we want to make the human. I mean, I'm still involved in conversation where people tell me, well, the standard of production per translator per day is 2,000 words. 2,500 like, words per day. <laughs> I'm thinking like, where do you live? Under the stone somewhere? These things need to be like in 10,000, 50,000, 100,000 per day, not 2,000 per day. And we have to produce them at a quality. That's why the training is important. No cutting corner with technology. And you're right. You bring up a very good, important point here. People also missing the point on data. It is about data. It's about training the engines into the right data. And if you don't have the data, there's data warehouses that sells you the data. The data can be acquired, but you need to train. You cannot open the box like you buy it from Amazon. Buy it from Amazon, exactly. open the box, plug it in, it works. It is not an Amazon purchase. You have to train <laughs> the data. You have to train it on a specific data that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it's, and we've been saying this since, since the statistical emission translation days, right? It's having the right data. And we didn't know how much it was. And we're getting better and better at it. But, but the, the whole key here... It's not just the number of people, the resources, it's the budget. We can have, we can have 30, 40, 50% more requests for translation per year, but we're not going to have 30% more budget per year, right? So we're trying mm-hmm. to balance the, 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 the keeping the budget as it is or the little bit extra you get with, with the number of requests coming in to balance it off and say, well, how much can we do with that same amount of budget or a little bit more, right? Because we're not going to increase mm-hmm. it. No one's, you cannot, a, a PM no. from a, from a, you cannot convince the client to get 50% more budget for the year, right? They're going to get mm-hmm. 3% and, more, right? And, and Jeff, so. Jeff, I, I feel like, and I, and I have several examples of this, I feel like this idea has been long coming, I feel, yeah. because yeah. there was a bottleneck in terms of global industry, of language industry in terms, in terms of production. And instead, and I feel like, I don't know if anybody talks about it more often, I'd love to have your opinion on this one. I feel like most of these ideas, they don't come from the industry. They come from outside the industry, and it's imposed on the industry. And the industry now has to react. So we're always in that reactionary mode. And since you've been in telecom, you can also relate to when telecom was going through the transformation. It did not happen from within the telecom industry. It came from the outside. And then the telecom industry has to react to it. Yeah, yeah. It's to you. It's. I mean, the majority of my ideas in, in I come up the years ago as innovative in the language industry, 30 years ago, right? The last 22 years, 20 years have been replicating it, right? In different fields. And it was really the telecom industry, uh, the whole architecture of, of, of working on, tra- on, on R&D of bug tracking systems and test tracking systems and, and backlog systems and stuff been working on in software energy that have taught me or helped me bring other things into the language industry that, that I would not have had if I'd stayed in the industry. And I think one of our problems is that there are few, very few people that have worked out of the industry that have gone out and fewer few that come back in. I, I keep coming back and in, right? And I meet with a few people from time and say, hey, you're one of those people, right? The, there are lots of people that have stayed in the industry, in the language industry for so long, they've been accustomed to the pricing model and all that, and they're all stuck in this pricing thing. They're all stuck in the whole dilemma of that. And really, really, if you think out of the box and say, well, how can we bring other things that we're seeing <clears throat> outside into that that's what we're seeing right now with generative ai in the past year right it's yeah, really that's right. now we're seeing it and now the industry every industry has to kind of deal with this finance utilities you know gas whatever every industry is being impacted and they have to think out of the box and that's right the like industry is now kind of stuck in that there's we're focused on it right now how can we do it like the others are experiencing right yeah you're right you bring up a, the budget is very important too because Actually, I was listening to Bill Mar- Bill Mar. I probably should not be saying his name on this channel, but I'll say it anyway. Bill Mar the other day, actually this morning, and he was talking about Mr. Beast, that uh, YouTube personality who's got like billions of viewers, etc. So it just kind of reminded me because there was a there was an article remind me about him because there was an article on Slater, which people can find it still, where Mr. Beast wanted to translate his videos or localize his videos. And he had an issue with the industry, was not re- localizing it on his budget, on his time, et cetera. So what did the guy do? Went and opened his own company using AI. Yes. Like, 
Are we driving people nuts to a point where they're devising their own solution now? Or, you know, this is where our industry is like, you know, of course, you're going to have two or three categories of the industry. You're going to have the people that they're going to be innovative. They're going to be always looking for things better to do or to perform their job. Mm -hmm. We're always going to have those customers that says, well, look, I want to get it done the old artisan fashion way. I want to see the translator. I want him to come to my office. I want to take him. Do you translate and translate and approve the cycle, <laughs> That's right. right? That's right. You want to do that? Fine. There are people that can do that can help you with that. Yeah. But the majority of the market, the new generation, the Gen Z, the the you know, this is where we missing the boat. The buyers are changing. You know, the buyers are not like your 60, 70 year old people that you worked with, you know, decades ago. The buyers yeah. are brand new buyers. They, yeah. you know, I've got many people saying, where's the app? How can I download it? Like, <laughs> it's, it's pretty yeah. amazing. We're not in tune with our buyers. And I remember my first, I, you know, Loke World event I went to, and I think that was the last one I went to. I went to one only. I don't know, maybe it set me in the wrong direction, but here you go. Here I am now. And I heard the discussions around that. And I came from the telecom industry. I was in the telecom industry before I joined this yeah. industry. So I heard, the first conversations I'm hearing is like, nobody's talking about the customer. Everybody's talking about, you know, how do I manipulate a file or, you know, how come I'm not producing, you know, this with this? Like, I'm thinking, like, where is the customer in this entire equation? Like, the conversation should be around the customer. What are yeah. we doing with the customer? What does the customer want? How are they behaving? How are they buying from us? You've hit on the, the topic of my new video book. It's, on, it's for free on YouTube. I talk about quality. And I keep telling, I've been saying for since 2014, stop talking about quality. Stop talking about quality. Stop talking about quality. Because everyone in this industry on their LinkedIn profiles is quality, quality. And we don't know what quality is, right? I mean, it's it's just, you don't know what it is. And I hear so many discussions about blue and all these scores. And, stuff, and that's not what quality is, right? It all comes down mm -hmm. to, I learned from the telecom industry, quality of service, right? And the hotel, I worked in hospitality for, you know, and in these industries, quality is based on knowing what the customer wants, right? And when you know what the customer wants, you're going to respond to those questions that they want. And if you if we we overestimate, we we over-engineer quality by thinking what we think the customer wants by doing too much, right? And my whole video book on my YouTube channel is calling, I'm trying to find a better name for it, but it, it's it's quality assessment or quality evalu evaluation based on sales and customer experience. That's the key. Right. And, and and it goes against the grain of all my engineering experience because I'm saying I learned what to figure out what the customer wants and I'm going to respond to that. And I'm not going to do right. more than they ask for unless right. they ask for more than you charge them more. Right? That's, <laughs> so right. That's right. That's right. That's right. We okay. cannot over engineer this. I mean, we're yeah. not nobody like we live in an, we live in an economy right now globally, not just like in North America. Everybody's feeling the same. You cannot over engineer anything. You yep. cannot over-engineer a car. You cannot over-engineer a bridge. You have to engineer it to the specification of what the customer wants or needs yep. now. Yep. And nobody, and I don't know if it's true or not, but I don't feel, some people feel like they should be the authority on translation. You know, when I give you my passport to be translated to another language, somebody needs to stamp it and put their name on it because the government wants to make sure that this passport is good. But that's not what we're talking about. We, this is completely different discussion than translating a passport. This is, yeah. you know, of course, that's still needed. And there's notary that will do that for you or translators that they're certified or notarized that will do that for you. But what we're talking about right now is massive amount of volume of content that needs to be translated. Yeah. We yeah. cannot be the judge of the translation. We can, to some extent, and deem it necessary. But the, the ultimate judge for that, custom, for, that, for that translation or that language delivery model that we're using is the consumer. Did the consumer... Yes. Work with it. And and the other thing that we people like, I don't know if it's if you're coming into those discussions is, is did the content that you create, and that's the question that everybody's wrestling with, has achieved its goal? And what was that goal of the content? <laughs> exactly. Purpose driven, <laughs> purpose driven, purpose driven. It's purpose driven. That's the whole thing. I've been saying for like 15 years, right? And and Correct. I'll cite Kurt Kurt Godden. Kurt Godden and Linda Means worked at General Motors back in, in the late 90s on control language, right? And automated translation, all that. And Kurt did, gave a talk at the Society for Automotive Engineering, the top tech in Amsterdam in, in 1999. I was there. And he said, you know, he worked in the General Motors, right? So automated. He went to, a, he went to a, an automotive film, um, event, right? And he was looking at the new cars. And he saw some new car in another model, another brand, <laughs> right? 
And he says, he looked at this low, the, the kind of the beginner pricing, right? This, this car. And he says the doors on the inside were too perfect. They were mm -hmm. too perfect. They did the inside seams of the doors <laughs> too well. They over-engineered the car so that the cost of the car was too expensive for the price that the consumer wants to buy, right? And that's over-engineering. And that, that, uh, that was what I, in 1999, this is over-engineering. And what we do is we over-engineer the quality of the translation we do, and we make it too expensive. And then we wonder why the customers don't buy it, right? <laughs> so, I'll, I'll tell you a little <laughs> anecdote to make you laugh a little bit. When I first started with the, with the industry 20 years ago, everybody was, you know, we were working from an office as you, cubicles and et cetera. So, so this manager walked into to one of the translators who's translating a document and the manager says, and I, I was walking in the hallway, so I overheard it. He said, hey, Picasso, you know, painting the Mona Lisa took a long time. I want you to paint the same Mona Lisa faster, <laughs> faster, <laughs> and less expensive, less the internal less cost, right? That's right. It's exactly what it is. It's exactly yeah. it. So, so yeah. I mean, we all agree, and I feel like I'm enjoying this conversation so much. I'm probably gonna let it go for two hours, but this is <laughs> this is great conversation. Yeah. I don't know why, but I feel like I've worked with you before. I've met you before. I don't know. We seem to be on the same wavelength in terms of thinking. So. No, well, I, I was going to check. Our, I was going to check my LinkedIn profile to see when we actually connected for the first time. I haven't done that yet, but I'm sure it was at least 15 years ago, right? Yeah, I and, think you know, so. Yeah, and at least 15 years ago, because you were one of my first people, right? And and yeah, I, that's get, right. I get eleven. I get eleven thousand contacts, but I get eleven thousand with thirty percent are recruiters, right? I got thirty percent of my people are recruiters. I always have twenty thousand each, right? So it's and we've been following. I've been following you for fifteen years, right? Everything you're doing, I'm watching. Is get I get spammed with all the posts, right? So I'm looking at them. I'm looking at them and see what you're doing, what you're talking about, what you're doing, and and. You're covering a wide range of things, right? Because your background, right? You're not focused on only this thing, only talking no. about production, right? And all that. You're looking right. at the big picture, right? And so like this, after, like this afternoon, for instance, I'm recording another episode this afternoon. This is the translator's perspective. So yeah. I'm interviewing a translator. I want to know what are they thinking? Like, how are they seeing all this and how are yeah. they adapting to it? So, yeah, you're right. I mean, I try to cover because there's many angles that you can look at this at any topic. And yeah, the yeah. danger is if you concentrate too much on one angle, then you become, you know, from an opinion perspective, you become, you become very polarized to yeah. that particular opinion. And I don't yeah. want to do that. Yeah, it, one, of you, one of the things that really I'm really interested in, I, and I hope you can do me this favor, I heard you sing about localization. And I know your, your nickname was Lock and Roll. In one of the in one of the in one of the episodes of in one of the uh, issues of Multilingual Magazine, yeah. they nicknamed you Lock and Roll. Is there a yeah. way that you can just one verse or two verse you can belt them out right now, or am I putting you on the what, spot? What, I don't well, care actually, about what they sound the like. Channel, I did with Tony O'Dowd. Tony O'Dowd, he's a musician too. Uh, you know, the Catalyst, Alchemy Catalyst, beginning right now. He's doing. He's works on the Canton NT, right? And and he and I did a we did a music. We did it in 2015 for ELIA, the uh, European Language Industry Association. We, I wanted to do a, a, a concert at there, and we had, we get to we get to actually sing at Bocuse in France, right? This is the oh best restaurant in France, <laughs> the best restaurant. So I was trying to find a way to, to sponsor the conference. I said, let's cre let's create a groove sponsor, right? And we went. So I already had invent, invented the word guilty giggers, right? G I L T <laughs> guilty giggers. So I created that brand name. 10 years ago, 12 years ago, and I tried to find a bunch of musicians to kind of want to do the guilty. We played industry events, right? Yeah. And one or two. Then we called ourselves at this Bocuse restaurant, Ellie, in, in, in 2015. We called ourselves the Bilingual Busking Buddies. And so we actually played. I love restaurant. it. We, we created a, a menu, a musical menu. We, we told everybody we will do live karaoke. And we actually did it at the event. We were the, you know, we were participants and we were conference, you know speakers too and we did the musical things and it was just the whole evening we we're doing this and we videoed it some of it we did you know record some of it and i get up on me my, my, on my uh, youtube channel calling ourselves the bilingual busking buddies and the guilty giggers right and we did a t-shirt and everything so it's just like it was oh, hilarious, great. Hilarious, right? hold on once for a second got a call coming in decline that call decline the call that's, all right. In, right? that's so, okay hey can i can i ask you to you know sing a couple of verses or maybe a verse or two I'll tell you what that is. So 
I created, what I do is I reword, or I reword songs, right? I re-lyric them. And so I took Toto's Hold the Line and I re-lyriced it to, I have five different versions that I've done. And one's called Hold Your Words. Hold Your so Words, re- that's great. I hold your words. So I got, so I got five different versions in five different industries, but one called the translation, the translation industry called Hold Your Words, right? Okay. And I can't remember the words because I don't memorize any of the songs I do. I have a PowerPoint that I do it. But it's up on my YouTube channel on Jeff Allen France. Do you mind and if I've we remix it, it into if, – if you don't want to sing it now, that's fine. But we can remix it into the, uh, well, into yeah, the video. Well, yeah, remix it in. Yeah, so I did, I did a professional <clears throat> version of this, right? I did a okay. professional recording visual, and I did it. It's up on my YouTube channel. I'll give the link to it. And so I've done Hold, hold Your Words. And I have another one at the for – the, for the, we call it the, the, men's, the men's camp. I mean, we had a, a group in, in France, or no, in Europe, all the localization men wanted to create a men's camp at one of the guys' places. And I created Hold Your Beer. Hold Your so Beer. I have a version hold of beer. Hold Your Beer in the localization industry for men. <laughs> and I have Hold Your Words, right? It's so two different versions of this thing, right? So, oh, so I read lyric songs. I did one called uh, "Your Wham Last Last Christmas." I gave oh, you yeah, my I love it. Yeah. <laughs> now with this one, I re lyriced it. It's last conference. I gave him my thoughts, but the very next week, transferred to a geek. Next year, to change my fifties. I'll give them. And I made the whole. And I talked about last once bitten and twice shy. I, but I keep my TMs, but you're something to catch my eye, something like a billion words. I free lyric the whole thing. It's <laughs> oh, in the goodness. same meter, the same stuff. It's just a few different words, right? It's all up in LinkedIn. Well, I'll give you the links to these things. So. Yeah, I really appreciate it. No, this is very fun. I tell you, like, I could talk to you for a couple of days. Like, I feel like <laughs> this is a very interesting conversation. Yeah. I feel like I'm in my comfort zone here when I'm talking to you. And I just feel like one of these days I'm going to meet you in person. I do have a conference coming up in May. I'm, I'm the president of the Canadian Language Industry Association. Right. We have a conference coming up in May. Maybe I'll invite you to perform. That's it. One of those. Hey, you know, I, I love the the last Christmas one. We're ready, to, we're ready to do it. Right. So, <laughs> hey, and now I've got, I've gone in the last year, I've actually gone to more portable. I've actually got a, you're going to laugh here. I've got, I've got a ukulele bass guitar here. It's a small oh, wow. little bass guitar. It's and I've gone so small. I got it's a it's a bass guitar that's this size, a ukulele size. Uh huh. And I have I it's have a bass that. guitar. I have oh, it's a bass guitar with 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 rubber strings, and you can amp it. And then you can laugh here. I've got here my new drum kit. It's no longer a drum kit anymore. It's this. You can laugh at this. It's an ergonomic keyboard. This is a drum kit. No and way. You play left, yes. And it's so cool. It's just, this is crazy. I just go like this, but turn the thing on, and I can play the drums with this thing, right? Oh, wow. Amazing. This, and I have a, I have a foldable keyboard that I can fold up to the rehearsals. You're, you're literally a one-man band, man. I'm a one-man band. I have a looper. <laughs> I'm working on the work, and so I can actually do songs. I've picked songs like English in New York, Zombie, a few, a few songs. And, and journeys don't stop believing that are all they repeat themselves. So I can actually do just do little measures and loop them all in and create the song. And do I it love in front it. Of people and then show it, right? Oh man, you make, you make language fun. How's that? It's fun. It's fun. It's fun. And you it's make all language I fun. Now. I can carry the things, all these little, I don't have to bring, you know, carts anymore. I just, I can have everything in like one, you know, on a couple of backpacks and stuff. And I can, it's all portable, right? So. So excellent. I get other yeah. instruments in the room up there, but I'm not going to go get them. Right. Fine, my man. amps, okay. my amps are battery powered. Everything's battery powered. We said this in the lock and roll mag- issue of, of, of multilingual in 2023 in January, and we said I'm the battery rechargeable musician. Right. Every, all my instruments are rechargeable. Everything's rechargeable. And if I don't have like my my pedals or my t- my mixing board, I don't have it. I have a power station that can actually charge it. Right. That recharge the power station. So I can go anywhere <laughs> and I can, I have things in my car, my back of my car, the trunk is a music studio. Oh my God. <laughs> and I can go anywhere and play a concert, right? <laughs> so. Man, you, you're a man of multi-talent. I, I am, I am I'm amazed and I'm so honored to be with you today. I really appreciate it, Jeff. And I want to take the moment here to thank you for taking your time. A man with such talents and experience and expertise you know, I am really, truly honored to have a grateful to have to have been, you know, talking to you for almost an hour. And I didn't feel like an hour. 
<laughs> and I hope the audience, when they listen to this, they appreciate it as much as I, I appreciate it. And they get excited yeah. about this conversation as much as I am excited about this conversation. Yeah. So thank I you again for being part of this conversation, Jeff. And sure. any last uh, thoughts or words before we adjourn? Yeah, I mean, the whole AI topic, it's like COVID, right? Every became an expert in mask. Everything is a mask, right? And I see a lot in every industry, including this industry, where people are becoming the experts in AI, right? A lot are enthusiasts, but then it gets down to is, do people really know what they're talking about? You know, really, 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 really know about it and having done it. And, and I kind of, in the past, I think 20 years, I've learned to talk about things I know and don't talk about things I don't know about, right? And, and, and refer to people. go for everybody, by the way. And so, and so, and I use, I do a lot of things. I've learned a lot of things, right? But I've learned to, and I told my boss, I don't talk about things I don't know. You know, I will refer to someone else. And I encourage all of us to make sure that when you talk about it, because it will become known, right? You know, if you know what you're talking about or not. And if you really know the topic, somebody asks you a really hard question, right? So, you know, this is something we need to be careful of in every industry we work with, right? To, to talk about what you know. And, and be careful of what you don't know. Or there's somebody else that knows it better, right? So Absolutely. that keeps us humble. So, yeah, and I, so you know, on this note, I really want to thank you again, uh, Jeff, for coming online here with me today and, and, and uh, putting this yeah. uh, episode of the Fire Local Localization Fireside Chat together. Appreciate it. Next and I feel time. like with, with, the, with the fireplace and everything. So I really appreciate the effort that to set up your studio there in your home uh, in France. I really appreciate that. Uh, also, yeah. if you're ever in North America or if I'm ever in France, I will look you up. I want to meet you in person. This is a shame that we have not met yet over the past 15 years. This is a crime almost. So I really appreciate it. Well, I never so get budget you. to do travel, right? That's why I do this. That's right. Thing. I mean, it's, I, I don't worry is, about that. I didn't ask for budget to go to conferences anymore. I say, don't worry about it. Don't have to reimburse me and stuff. I'll make sure that I get there with the music, right? So <laughs> That's right. That's right. You find a way to do it. Excellent. I found a way to do it. So thanks again. I'm going to stop the recording here. And I sure. really appreciate you coming online, Jeff, with me today. I wish you all the best. And Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays to you and to your loved one. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks for tuning in to the Localization Fireside Chat. Take the warmth of knowledge and renewed cultural passion with you. Keep exploring, stay curious, and until next time, this is Robin Ayu. Keep those global conversations alive.